So anyway, welcome to everybody and thank you very much for joining us at our third annual River Neighbors presentation. Um, this event is sponsored by Pelican Sound Golf and River Club's Watercraft and River Committee, the WRC. My name is Mark Goldstein. I am the chair of the WRC this year and I do not run Zoom meetings, so don't shoot the messenger. Uh, the river presentation itself was the brainchild of my predecessor in the chair, Janet O'Hara, who once again organized this year's event and actually asked me if I was okay with her doing that, which of course I am. Uh, but we thank Janet very much for her efforts. We had such a huge turnout last year that we planned on finding a bigger facility, but as it turned out, we, like thousands of others across the country, are holding a virtual online meeting this year. Hopefully next year we'll have a live event again, uh, possibly in conjunction with Zoom. Now all of us know the Estero River is one of the greatest things about living in Estero. It provides fish, reptiles, birds, and people with places to live and recreate, and we care very much about being able to share the river and keep it navigable and safe for paddlers, power boaters, and PWCs. This estuary also provides an important function of draining a very large portion of Lee County. We certainly saw during Hurricane Irma and our major storm since then that the Estero River funnels billions of gallons of water from our communities out into Estero Bay and the Gulf of Mexico. Our committee, both past and present, hopes to continue building a coalition of river neighbors so that we can work together to support efforts on behalf of the river and other waterways in and around Estero. Quite a few of our river neighbors are with us today. Um, we're hoping that everybody hung in there, but we've invited pretty much all the neighboring communities, local regional organizations working on behalf of our local waters, along with the village of Estero, who has embraced our river as one of our major assets. We estimate attendance today at 250, hopefully, which is a big jump from the 50 or so that attended the first presentation. Now, this is certainly a testament to the importance of this river and its future. So we, we welcome your questions today. We want you to know that all the questions and answers will be at the end of the program to allow all the speakers uh, their time. You'll note on your Zoom screen, you have the ability to submit questions to the panel. And our Assistant General Manager here at Pelican Sound, Travis Childers, will be coordinating the Zoom functions and the Q&A later. So today we're going to hear from Katie Arrington, the Vice Mayor of Estero, David Willems, who is the Public Works Director of Estero, Doctors Donald Duke and Serge Thomas from the FGCU Water School, Kevin Royne, Lee County Commissioner, and Jennifer Hecker, Executive Director of the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership. So without delaying any further, I'm going to turn it over to Katie Arrington and uh, welcome Katie. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Mark. Uh, on behalf of the entire Village Council, thank you for your interest in the Estero River. As you may know, the, the Village Council views the Estero River as one of our many important community assets. We have many projects that are ongoing that focus on improving the access and condition of the river. You will hear more about these projects in the following presentations, including first and foremost, you are probably well aware that the very first purchase by the village was the 67 acres along the Estero River on the east side of US 41 for over $24 million. It was a bold move for a new city with an annual budget of only 12 million. Is the Estero River a priority? Absolutely yes. The primary purpose in purchasing the property was to preserve and protect our river frontage. But we also want to protect this rare piece of old growth forest we are in the planning stages on what to do with this land. Those discussions will occur over the next year and the discussion will be very open to the public. We will be considering a forest preserve, a botanic, botanical garden, an environmental science center, some limited commercial and some limited residential development. Overall, our objective is to balance environmental pre preservation with recreational opportunities with the financial challenges of our community. This will be an interesting process. Second, the village commissioned a study of water quality issues along the entire stretch of the Estero River to be performed by FGCU. That study <clears throat> is generally complete. 
you will hear more from this from Dr. Donald Duke and Dr. Serge Thomas later in this discussion. You also are probably aware that the village is moving to connect septic systems and package plants to central sewer. We have completed a review of those systems and we have begun a program to make this happen. Banks Engineering has done the initial analysis and 2022 could see the first projects to package plants. Our Village of Estero Director of Public Works, David Willems, is another speaker on today's agenda and he will be describing this effort. The Village of Estero will be also improving the current water quality monitoring along the Estero River and Halfway Creek. The county currently monitors water quality at four locations along the two rivers. The village will be adding five additional locations to provide better coverage. David will be providing more details on this later. The village has also completed detailed review of the river to identify ever, where areas are heavy with siltation that impacted the overall function of the river. We are in the process of permitting plans to remove excessive siltation that accumulated over the years, including heavy impacts from Hurricane Irma. This project is budgeted in the Village Capital Improvement Program. Lastly, the village is also underway with improvements to the North Branch of the Estero River upstream where the river runs through the villages at Country Creek. A portion of the river that goes around Bamboo Island is entirely blocked with silt. This will be restoring that flow way to lessen the potential for flooding. Village Council approved the design and permitting of this project at the March 3rd, 2021 Council meeting. As you can see, the village is very committed to improving the Estero River. We appreciate your concern and involvement. So now I'll turn it over to Dr. Duke and Dr. Thomas. Thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone. Um, Dr. Thomas just got me on the phone and so he's working his way in for the moment. Uh, it'll be me and we'll take questions as we can. Um, I'm Don Duke. I'm showing a date of February 9 on here. That's of course incorrect. Today's March 9th. Um, Let's just move forward. Travis, why don't you show our slides and I'll see what I can do to uh, not use up more time than we need to very briefly. So this is us. I'm in the upper picture. I'm the one on the left. Uh, Serge Thomas is in the lower picture. He's also on the left in that one. Uh, just showing you some of the field work we do. You know, this is a slide just to introduce us. Let's move to the next one, Travis. I wanted to show briefly uh, the cover page of the report that we've not yet submitted. Uh, Dave Willems is on the line here wondering where this report is soon. Um, but the, the purpose for this title page is to show just how many people were involved in this under researchers. All but one of those people are students. We rotated a dozen students through this thing. And it's the kind of work we can do in the water school with really modest funding, um, achieve some results that uh, have some real value, we hope, and also train a lot of people as they move forward in their careers. Um, and these folks got some invaluable opportunities to not only be in the field, which is uh, important and highly technical, but to interpret those numbers and try to make some sense of them is terrific training for students. The next slide shows, um, I promise you that I'm not gonna work through all the details on this slide. This is just an example for you of a poster that we presented at a national conference. It was all online too. In fact, one of these students is on the phone here with us now. If you have any questions, Emily probably can answer them better than I can for all this stuff. But um, this is to illustrate for you the kind of results we got and the kind of widespread information sharing we were able to achieve from this. And uh, no details of that poster. We'll be happy to talk to you, but let's not do that today. Um, what's our next slide, Travis? And Don Serge is with us now as well. Fantastic. Hi, Serge. Hey. Come on in. Um, we're just getting to... Uh, the meat. So I asked myself, how would I describe fecal bacteria? That's, uh, you know, probably 50 years of research and achievements. And these were the sort of high points off the top of my head. Um, a complicated subject that we can't really uh, easily make accessible to a uh, short meeting like this, but some of the key points. The term fecal indicator bacteria, that's a little bit scary because we're talking about fecal matter and we're worried about that because um, 
in bullet two here, they're surrogates for what we really want to measure, which is organisms in human fecal matter can spread disease. There's a, a quick and overall summary for you. We don't want human fecal matter to come into contact with our waterways. How's that for maybe the most obvious thing you've heard today? There are federal and state level standards for indicator bacteria. And the reason for that is the indicator bacteria are something that we can relatively easily measure. There've been laboratory techniques available for this for, I don't know, 50 years or more, um, but they're not the things that we're really worried about. The things we really care about are things that can cause disease. Now we know absolutely that disease can be transmitted uh, by contact with, uh, with human fecal matter. But um, the problem is there's thousands of microorganisms that can do that. Some of the big well-known really scary things like cholera, typhus uh, are waterborne diseases and that originate with contact with uh, fecal matter. Um, but we don't wanna go test every water body for cholera, typhus and thousands of other substances. For one thing, they're pretty hard to test for. For another, they're present in really small amounts. You certainly hope so. The substances that are detectable and present in larger amounts, we measure because they're easier to measure, but they're not the things we most care about. Like the old joke about uh, the drunk person looking for their car keys under the spotlight. I dropped them half a block over, but the light's better over here. We're looking where the light is better for these bacteria. So there are state level standards for these things. Why am I going through all this? The point is that what we have information on is imperfect for what we really care about. And it's what makes this such a complicated topic. They are highly variable in the environment by time and place. That means microorganisms that are present in enough concentration to make somebody sick. We're talking about maybe it's earache, maybe it's stomach ache. Uh, in the worst cases, one of those uh, uh, very bad fatal diseases. Those are very rare, of course. Organisms are, um, uh, are so mobile in the environment that um, you can't just go take a picture of the river and say, here's what the Estero River looks like. I was pleased with one of the questions that came in by email that said, what's the current condition of the river? And the questioner asked, is it uh, trace or moderate or bad or really bad or, or something like that? And the answer is, depends on what day you're asking, maybe even what hour you're asking. Rivers flow, sources are, are highly episodic. And um, we can't just say the Estero River looks like this. Otherwise, our job would be so much easier. And what uh, David Willems hired us to do, the work that we'd be doing for Katie and the rest of the village, um, we could give you an answer. But instead, we're like one of those uh, groups of scientists that always says, sorry, I have to study it more. It's just very variable. So it was the subject of our study for a year. Um, the report has all the details in it. I couldn't hope to identify all those details today, but we have a few things we can share with you. Serge, so what is the best way for you to work in? Do you want to talk about some of these things? Shall I keep I'll rolling until you get a point? You and I will complement. Okay. If you can hear me, I, I was having a lot of issues with my microphone earlier, so in previous meeting. We've, we've got issues, but we're rolling now. Um, so one of the first things we did, of course, was, as Katie mentioned, the county has been studying this for some time. We looked at some of the historical data. And so these are two locations where the county has sampled for as much as five years. There's actually a longer record than this, but it's not all comparable for a variety of complicating ways. I'd like you to see the difference between the upper and the lower graphs. This is one of those two fecal indicator bacteria called enterococci. Um, this is not the one that causes disease. This is what we think indicates that there might be presence of other problems. The difference between the upper and the lower graph is downstream and upstream on the Estero River. At Three Oaks, there's very little development upstream from there. Actually, the university is upstream from there, but um, you know, universities are different kind of land uses than, than urban land uses. Um, so upstream of Three Oaks, you'll see the data points here uh, exceed that dashed blue line very seldom. But even so, they're variable. There are days, uh, there were a couple days in the last five years when it was identified that uh, that part of the river probably would not be safe to bathe in. I mean, we're not expecting to swim in the Estero River anyway. Uh, this suggests on most days at Three Oaks, um, we wouldn't have any, any issues. The difference here is not um, the difference between a high and low amount at one location or another, but how much variability there is. The upper graph is further downstream. In fact, it's right opposite 
Pelican Sound at the location that the county calls Riverwoods. And you'll see there's eight or nine occasions when that concentration was so high, it's literally off our chart. The laboratory can measure up to 2410, I think it is. Um, most probable number per 100 milliliters are the units here. And you'll see that on some of those days, this was, um, can I just say scary high? And on other days, we saw concentrations um, between around 500 and 2,000. And the dash blue line here is at uh, 130. So the standard says you shouldn't exceed 130 more than 10% of the time. You can see in that upper graph, it absolutely does. So what's the state of the Estero River? It varies. But uh, further downstream, where there's more influence of human activities, and some areas that uh, this is downstream of at least some septic tanks, and at least some of those packaged plants that we'll be hearing about later. And it's downstream of all kinds of backyards and golf courses and uh, dogs that use those backyards. Did I mention one of the problems with fecal indicator bacteria is that they indicate any warm blooded animal species. And, you know, animals use the natural environment, not just dogs that I mentioned, but uh, birds and other things that we expect to use that natural environment. It's hard to tell from that what's human and what is not. I would say that birds use the upper part of the river too. So the fact that we see very low, very seldom high concentrations in the upper part and very more in the lower part, that's an indication that we humans are affecting that river. That's what I take from these data. Anything you want to add to that, Serge? No, I think it's good. Okay. That's an example. That's just one of the two bacteria we use. It's just two of the multiple locations we use, but uh, that's a summation of the points. I have one more content slide then. Um, oh, I forgot I had this one in. This is the other of the two fecal bacteria and it makes the same point. Let's just move to the next one. We then did some sampling at 10 locations on the river where we did um, what I'm calling length of the river sampling. We wanted to get a picture on a given day. How does it vary by location? If the assumption is that on one day it might be uh, uh, an impaired river and on other days it might be of fine water quality, well, let's try to get a snapshot on a day. So we were out there in boats and in the upper reaches, in some cases in waders, and uh, all 10 of these locations were sampled within a four hour period, seven separate times in our uh, work for the village. Um, two of these locations are the same ones that I just showed you. Uh, let's see the next one, Travis. So just as an example, this is two length of the river events. And mostly what I'd like you to take from this is just how variable it is in both time and space. Those two organisms I referred to, Enterococci and E. coli, appear in blue and green respectively. Um, it turns out those organisms don't even vary together. So there's a big difference between the two of them. If we say is the river uh, in good shape at this place today, it might depend on which of these two you look at. But look how variable it is in the upper graph there. Um, this is, uh, let's see, the scale shows river miles. So the furthest downstream is uh, down near the estuary. The Riverwoods location is at around mile three and uh, mile five and a half is uh, somewhere downstream of that Three Oaks Bridge. So you can see that through parts of the village of Estero on one date, July 28th, sorry, July 14th is the upper one, um, and Terracocai was off the charts uh, through the middle parts of that river in an area we happen to know some package plants uh, occasionally discharge. Uh, but E. coli was not as high on those days. Certainly it was well above that target standard that I showed you though. Just two weeks later on July 28th, um, we see a whole different picture. It's still high, it's still above the standards in those upper reaches. But down in the middle part where we have some mixing, we might have some tidal influence, it's hard to say. We might have more uh, uh, groundwater discharge because it had rained recently, all those sorts of things. It's just very different to the different locations. A package plant, by that we mean we're talking about wastewater treatment plants and the distinction between a municipal plant that is huge and accepts wastewater from, uh, you know, half of a county or something like that. A package plant is a small one that's operated um, often by a given community. Uh, and typically these are old. That's because EPA doesn't allow new ones anymore, but uh, some of these have been operating since the 1950s. And so there are a couple of those along the Estero River at some of the really older developments. 
and they're operated privately and they're harder to regulate and there's nothing inherently wrong with it. They're still treating wastewater just as we expect any facility to do. But because they're typically old, they're typically on a much smaller scale, they don't get the kind of attention that uh, a municipality would bring to its treatment plant. The smaller plants that, that we call package plants, I have no idea where the term originated, but uh, they're smaller, they're privately owned, and they can be less well regulated. And uh, so I'll let Mr. Willems tell us all about uh, how the village plans to deal with that. Maybe you've got a whole different take on that, but that's my definition of it. That's where I expected to end. I will stick around if we have questions at the end. I tried to answer some of the questions I saw come in and I just talked nonstop and Serge didn't say a word except hello, my name is. Well, well, I think Don also, uh, um, you know, we have a lot of confounding factor, as you mentioned, you know, we have the, we have the, the stretch of the river that extends, um, you know, to the estuary. So we're moving from fresh water to salt water we also have a tide, it's a tidal um, river, so we also have the tide um, that also can influence and, and especially the, the sediment. So we have good reason to think that we also have those bacteria living in the sediment that um, actually we found papers and evidence that those bacteria, even though they can live in the gut of uh, warm blooded animals can also multiply in the sediment. So we also use the other tracer to be able to, to trace um, eventually uh, septic tanks and uh, package plants uh, effluents getting into the, the river and we use sucralose for that. So sucralose is, is fake sugar, right? So um, normally natural birds, animals will not actually uh, drink Diet Coke or alike. So, you know, you, we use this as a way to, to trace it. And that, that proved to be a better way to trace uh, the human connection using uh, sucralose rather than looking at those, um, yes, elevated number of, of, of um, bacteria, but we also have reason to think that there might be also some confounding effect with bacteria living in the sediment and eventually multiplying in the sediment, um, which will um, sometimes inflate those numbers, especially if we're sampling, um, let's say on an incoming tide from a low tide going up, uh, where the sed sediment might be stirred by either the boat when we're sampling or by the tide itself. Um, so it, it gets very complicated and, and um, there's a lot of people who think that the bacteria might not be the best indicator of human um, activities. Are, um, there might be better ways to trace, to trace that. Sucralose is one of them. Caffeine, some people use caffeine as well. Um, but caffeine is short-lived. Sucralose is a dead end in the food chain, so it's easier to trace and better, better, better tracer of, of um, human um, not waste but reclaim reclaim water or, or polished water coming out of septic tank or or leaching out of septic tank or coming out of a, a package plant. Don, you want to add to this? I mean, I think it was it's quite important to 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 denote that because you know we have those elevated amount of bacteria and um, we we also trace the trace the trace the nutrient and the the human influence through through other means than than just bacteria. We have so much we could add, but in the short time today, we should move along. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to share these with everyone and we can talk about it in any other time that we might be able to. All right, well, thank you, Don and Serge. We certainly appreciate your, your time and information today. And our next speaker will be the Village of Estero Public Works Director, David Willems. All right, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to do is just go over some of the projects that the Village of Estero is doing right now um, that affect the uh, Estero River. Um, there's, there's five of them that I'd like to talk about. One is the sediment removal. Um, we're working on that, um, getting into the permitting. Um, there are some areas where we need to do some trimming um, and we're working with the Water Management District and Lee County to to address some of that. Um, we're going to expand the water quality monitoring within Estero. Um, one of the, was going to touch on the septic to sewer, which uh, is affected by the packaged wastewater treatment plants, and then also get into some of the drainage improvements that uh, the vice mayor talked about on the no upper reaches of the uh, north branch of the Estero River. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the sediment removal. Um, the reason we wanted to do that project was uh, first determine how much sediment's in the river. Um, it's been a long time since really any work's been done on the river as far as 
um, sediment re removal or even surveying to, to understand how shallow it is. You know, we get a lot of information from boaters that, you know, complain, especially down by the mouth, how, how shallow it is and how difficult it is to get through there. But um, we got the data last year. Um, our consultant, Coastal Engineering, has now um, brought that to council and has made some recommended improvements, which I'm going to go over today. Um, and that, so the, the next slide is, you know, what, what, where are we at in this uh, process? So the contract's really brought that, broken down into three phases. Um, we've completed the first and it's, are getting close to completing the second phase. So we've gotten all the information, the background data. Um, right now, our consultant has completed the, the permitting application for the state and federal agencies. Um, we're reviewing that right now. So hopefully in the next month or so, um, we'll be able to get that submitted. And then after we get the permits, then we'll, we'll go out to the bid. Um, unfortunately, with the state and federal permitting, that can take, you know, a year, maybe a year and a half to two years to, to complete. Um, but we do have money in the budget uh, a year or two out to be able to do um, some of that work. So what I wanted to do is go over the, the kind of the area that our consultant, uh, that you go to the next slide, the area our consultant's looking at for uh, removing some sediment, you know, they, they looked at um, the entire stretch all the way up to US 41, and they identified uh, numerous areas where there's either sediment buildup or there's buildup that is really impacting um, flow and, and boat traffic as well. Um, there really wasn't anything up by uh, US 41, um, that, that the depth there seems good. Um, but as you cross and go around um, the little peninsula that's on Tahiti Village, which is now a Stero Bay Village, um, you, there's some sediment there. Um, but the major part of the sediment is really the downstream end. Um, go to the next slide. And this is just a, a zoom in of the areas where they identified the sediment. And this is what we're going to be going to the um, federal and state agencies to permit. Um, but just because we're permitting it doesn't mean that's going to be an area that we remove sediment, you know, next year or the year after. Um, this is just getting a permit to, to do it. Um, and then we'll likely phase it because of cost. Um, this is an area that they expect to become a problem in the future. Um, it's not really a problem for flow or navigation right now, um, but it's something where they, they, they saw a buildup of sediment. So we're, we're going to talk to the agencies about removing some of that. Uh, the next area um, is really right, uh, right at basically um, Pelican Sound um, and then a little bit further downstream. Um, some of the outfalls from the developments on the north and south, and south side of the uh, river, there's some buildup of sediment, which is, is, you know, normal for, you know, the development. And, and this looks at addressing some of that. Um, and then as you get further downstream, um, where it start, the river starts to really uh, meander um, is where we get more of the, the, the areas that we probably look at, at dredging or uh, removing sediment in the, the first phase. Um, go to the next slide. Um, this area here is, is not only, you know, as it, it meanders back and forth, um, is where a lot of the boaters have, have mentioned that there's, there's issues with how narrow it is. There's really only room for one boat to get through there on plane. Um, so this is probably where the first phase is. And you'll notice that um, there is, the, it's hard to see, but there's the little blue hatching. Um, it does, so there are oysters and we, they're, they're, none of them are, um, connected, so they're, they're just sitting on the ground. Um, we'd look to avoid those as much as possible and, and, and move them if, if uh, we couldn't avoid them. And then this is just further downstream, um, same thing as, as what was upstream. And then this is just a, a cost estimate that our consultant did for us um, just to see how deep um, and then the costs associated with going deeper. Um, they're recommending the, the negative four um, they feel that's good for the flow of water back in, in and out and also um, safety. Um, and there's a big difference in cost when you go from even that extra half a foot, um, you know, going from $1.6 million to, to you know, over 2.9. Um, so again, we're, we're working on the permits applications right now. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll get that submitted and, and get working with the agencies to, to get approval. 
Um, there, we've re received some um, complaints about the, um, the canopy, you know, kind of really restricting um, not only boat traffic, but also if, if we got a big storm event, um, it would restrict the flow of water once the water got up high enough. And this is an area just downstream of US 41 um, where we've gotten a lot of complaints. We've gone out there and it, it definitely is starting to, to overgrow. Um, this area does have some mangroves, so we're, we have to permit that and get approval from the state. Um, but we've worked with uh, South Florida and Lee County. Um, they have some funds to you know, maintain stormwater flows. And once we get that permit, they have scheduled to, to do that removal um, this year. Um, the village here in the next uh, week or two, we're going to be out there in a kayak um, looking out all the other areas to see if there's other locations that need to be addressed. Um, and we're going to try to do that before the uh, wet season. That's something we do every year. Um, we, we kayak basically from the mouth all the way to Country Creek and just identify areas where there's down trees or, you know, other things that are, you know, overhanging into the uh, river that could impact flows uh, over the, the wet season. Um, water quality monitoring. Um, FGCU has really done like a, a focused monitoring effort um, really on the packaged wastewater treatment plants and the septic tanks. Um, the village is also going to do more of a broad brush um, water quality mo monitoring program. What we're going to do is we're going to take um, the four locations in the county or four locations in the village where the county actually currently monitors water quality. They've been doing it for 10 or 20 years. Um, and to get a little bit better um, you know, ability to hone in on where we might have water quality issues, um, the village is looking at, in the next month or two, starting to get water quality samples at five new locations. Um, and that's shown in the next slide. Um, so the, the yellow circles is where the county currently monitors um, water quality. And the village is going to look at adding the, where the red circles are. Um, and what that's going to do is, right now, we don't really have an idea of what's coming in from the south branch of the Estero River. So we're going to add a couple of locations there. And then we don't really understand what the water quality is coming in uh, halfway creek um, from the uh, Larry Kiker Preserve. Um, so we're going to add that. And then, you know, just to get a little bit more detail, we're going to add another location downstream of US 41 right at the uh, bridge crossing for West Bay Club. And what we're hoping to do is just get a better idea of where uh, any water quality issues are coming from. So as uh, uh, Serge and, and Don alluded to, the, the septic sewer is you know, a, a big thing that we're, we're trying to move forward with. Um, the results of their report is going to have some, something to say with you know, how we move forward. But um, we did have a consultant, Banks Engineering, um, basically look at the entire village and all the places that are not on central sewer um, so that we understood what, what it would take to connect all of those to central sewer. Um, took that to village council um, several months ago, and we kind of focused in on, on four locations to look at uh, potentially connecting these neighborhoods to central um, sewer and then water if they don't already have water. Um, the first three our um, communities that are on packaged wastewater treatment plants. Um, River Ranch Road, the reason that's on the list is because we're already doing other improvements in that location and it would make sense to do the, the septic at the same time so we didn't have to tear up the road. Um, the, the, the kind of the, the factor that, that makes it a little, take a little bit more time to get these accomplished is that um, there's gonna be required to have an assessment um, for those areas where we, connect them up to uh, sewer, um, and we're working on that process right now, but that, that's a, a long process because it has to get on tax rolls, and um, so it's, it's a long lead item, but we're moving forward on that. Um, so we're, we're working on getting that all together, and then the next slide um, shows really the locations of the areas that we're looking at. You can see two of them are directly on um, the Estero River, and they have uh, packaged wastewater treatment plants are really um, small versions of wastewater treatment plants, um, but they're not as advanced as the wastewater treatment plants that, uh, you know, the county has or Bonita Springs Utilities has. 
So you end up with uh, discharge water that, that usually has higher nutrients in there um, than you would have that's coming from uh, the county. Um, so we look at you know, getting those off of those packaged wastewater treatment plants, um, decommissioning those, and then their wastewater would go to um, the Lee County Utilities plant where it would be treated and then used for irrigation uh, throughout the county and the village. And then the last part we wanted to go over was, you know, the first uh, real um, large stormwater projects that we're working on with the flooding that happened in 2017 with Irma and then the, the storm that was before Irma. Um, we, we, kind of, we found out that we have a big uh, constriction in flow at Country Creek, the villages of Country Creek. Um, they have, uh, the, the, they filled into the floodplain when it was developed. They do have a ditch that takes the water around uh, the community, but it, during Irma, it really didn't function as well as uh, you would hope. Um, so the projects that we're looking at doing, um, one is to improve that ditch um, with the next slide to show that location. So that's what this project will do. Um, it'll get the water around um, Country Creek so that it doesn't back up um, and start flowing through the streets and uh, flooding uh, Three Oaks Parkway and other, other areas further north and upstream. And then the next project is um, the, the Estero River used to connect in two locations. Um, the area that people call Bamboo Island was truly an island. Um, right now, because of uh, it, this, this second connection filled in, um, anecdotally, some residents have told me that it, they feel like, they, they believe it closed in in the 90s. Um, there's actually only one connection now. Um, this is a dry creek bed, and what we look at doing is um, removing some of the, the dirt from there and, and reconnect that so that you have two paths of flow, which will help get more water downstream. Um, the interesting thing during Irma is that the south branch of the Estero River really didn't have the amount of flooding that the north branch is, and that might be just because of some of these connections. And that is all I have. So uh, later on, I'll be available for questions. Thank you, David. Our next speaker is Lee County Commissioner Kevin Ruane. Good afternoon, all. Can everybody see me? I'm, I don't know if I camera wise, but um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Kevin. Okay, great. Great. Um, didn't know if you can see me. So um, obviously, for some of you that may or may not know me, I've been involved in government and water quality for the last 14 years, predominantly working on Sanibel um, and trying to obviously navigate over to the county um, to expand uh, the county to play a more um, active role uh, in water quality. Um, it's really been a while since Lee County had um, all commissioners work on um, water quality, but no one's kind of owned it per se. Um, when I came in as commission, I basically had indicated I'd be working on two things, not that I won't be working on others, um, on the financial side, financial stability and fiscal prudence, and two, water quality. So those are the issues that I'm trying to get up to speed as quickly as possible. COVID has been a little bit of a deterrent in a lot of different aspects, even the ability to advocate and go up to Tallahassee and or Washington. But um, you know, my priorities are there. Uh, people want to know um, as far as testing and bacteria testing within the Estero River. Um, you know, we are certainly going to look at what we do currently. Um, I am more than open to try to expand the reach in, in those parameters um, as we can. Um, you know, we've had some of those challenges in just testing um, bacteria and beaches. Um, a lot of times there was funding and grants opportunities for us when I was on Sanibel and was able to do so um, and do that. So I don't know who spearheads this, but certainly my door is always open. Um, your district is, is not my district, but water quality is my uh, primary focus and all the county commissioners are, are aware of uh, my focus and what I want to continue to do. Um, I envision the mayors um, in Lee County and, and the county commissioner being someone like myself to be very much engaged in water quality and water quantity issues. And, and it's really hard to advocate for quantity 
if in fact uh, we're not taking care of quality. Um, in Sanibel, we took that responsibility in many, many actions. Um, the most aggressive was trying to convert all the sewer, um, um, obviously from septic to sewer, and your earlier presenter had indicated that, um, you know, that you had some package plants. Sanibel had to go through the trouble of buying package plants, taking them offline and going through the troubles of that. Um, they were certainly a source for a group of people. There was real customers with real revenue. So those are some of the challenges can certainly walk whoever is going through that process um, in that regard. I think the county needs to do uh, a much more aggressive job in looking at how we convert to septic um, at the last strategic planning meeting that we had, or the only one I had indicated that we should come up with something from a legislator point of view to have a septic inspection at time of real estate um, transfer. Um, try to come up with some measure. Um, septics that are leaching and breaching are ones that you want to address as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I know Sarah wants to take that on. It's a new city. Um, Sanibel was extremely aggressive in doing that. I can also indicate the challenge and hesitation for a lot of people with septic is, you know, address the items that are the having the most impact to the environment in a negative aspect. To do it all um, puts a big burden um, from a dead point of view on a young city, and Sanibel did that. Um, when I walked into the city between the sewer debt that was associated and so many other forms of debt, um, it put a really big burden on um, the city and we also had an unfunded pension mandate. So there was, you know, an unfund, under underfunded uh, pension, not mandate, but underfunded pension situation. So there was just a lot of issues. Sandbell's still dealing with its fourth phase of um, septic uh, to sewer conversions. They were the most difficult and uh, furthest connections that were going through its phase four. Um, but in the same token, I don't recall uh, any city or the county in all the years I went up advocating for um, dollars from Tallahassee that anyone was putting in for any separate septic conversions. Uh, we're doing so that. Further on along those lines, Sanibel has um, been working with its partner or, or, or co-city Captiva, which is unincorporated Lee County, with an opportunity to connect to its upgraded Donex um, plant. Um, there was and is capacity for Captiva to hook up to some of the final engineering studies. So I've been leading that when I was mayor of Sanibel and trying to work with Captiva and push it through the county um, in a way to finish that engineering study so we can attach um, more you know, obviously households to that uh, sewer system and Santa Barbara has their, you know, their capacity to do so. The good news is that a lot of the infrastructure is laid out um, so that might be easier. You know, along those lines, we're trying to identify the areas that are most needed within Lee County in the unincorporated areas to address, um, you know, septic being um, the issue um, that we really want to try to concentrate on the water quality. I mean, I heard about some of the other issues with runoff and reclaimed water and utilizing that and doing that. I'm happy that some of the other cities, but Fort Myers working with um, Cape Coral and, and, and trying to get rid of their affluent water in a more productive way. So we have a responsibility as cities to take care of water quality. Um, it makes our argument um, in front of the legislators a lot easier than when we're advocating for the quantity projects, um, you know, and I'm a big proponent in trying to do that um, in all aspects. So, I mean, those were some of the topics that, you know, I was asked to cover in my talk and I wanted to make sure I addressed the issues. Um, I'm new to this process. Um, obviously in any board, you work through the process and you work through, you um, building consensus and going through the process. But um, I ran on water quality. It's going to be a concentration and a priority for me. Um, and, and my job now is to try to have um, a couple of the commissioners as engaged and, and as enthusiastic. And they have been, I can't say they haven't, but someone needs to lead. Um, I've chosen to do that. Um, everyone's aware of my prior track record and what I'd like to try to do. Um, relative to that. So any things that come up, 
um, within your district. I mean, certainly Commissioner Sandelli is there, but I think he would graciously indicate to reach out to me. Um, he, along the path, would indicate, you know, if you want to talk water, go talk to Kevin Ruane. And, um, you know, so I have a good working relationship with Ray, and I know he covers your area and district. So, um, you know, if as a common courtesy, if there's an issue to just address it to him, I'm sure he'll hand the ball off to me, and he knows where I'm trying to stay concentrated on um, as far as water quality is concerned. Um, and septic is probably by far what we need to do a better job advocating as a community, advocating up to Lee County, uh, for Lee County and advocating up to Tallahassee because there's been money set aside under the DeSantis administration. And I've worked very closely with Noah Valenstein and there just isn't as many requests in um, for septic conversions. I mean, there's a huge demand, but I don't know if they're just not engineered and so ready, if you will. Um, so that's basically um, you know, what I can say from the high level talks um, at 14 weeks into the job. Um, I'm trying to understand the workings of the county. Uh, we have a lot of resources, but in the same token, there's a lot of people to work through um, and get to work with. Um, when you have uh, a wingman as James Evans uh, with you and we work together for as long, it's a lot easier just because we know each other um, in that regard, Roland and Kurt, Roland and Edie and, and Kurt Hawker Road are more than uh, capable people. It's just working through a different process and trying to understand how do we help um, and or assist. But I can tell you from a septic conversion, um, there's always been a responsibility where the cities take care of the city's responsibilities. So one of the questions is how do we convert septic to sewer, I'm not aware from a policy point of view where there's ever been any assistance from the county's point of view, unless it's in the unincorporated area, to participate um, from a financial point of view in that septic conversion. Um, I can tell you Sanibel took on close to $90 million worth of debt to get its own entire island uh, converted to septic. And like I had indicated earlier, that certainly has uh, financial ramifications that I just caution you do it in a most prudent way, but in the most effective way where they um, are breaching and leaching. Um, I think Sanibel took a very bold initiative when it started um, and just wanted to concentrate and go to sewer. Um, again, just make sure you understand what that debt looks like. Make sure you understand what the servicing is and what that does to the, uh, the tax rolls associated with it. Um, it's something I inherited. Um, you know, so that's basically um, you know, my uh, overall presentation. I didn't have an awful lot, um, and I wouldn't even proclaim to have an awful lot being 14 weeks into the job. So, um, but on the broad topics, you know, my concentration will certainly be on water quality. Thank you very much, Commissioner Ruane. Next, we will go to the Executive Director of the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership, Jennifer Hecker. Well, thank you first of all to Pelican Sound for having us today and inviting us to speak. Um, Travis, if you don't mind putting up our presentation. So while we're waiting for that, which I believe should be coming up here shortly, hopefully, um, just a little bit about the Coastal and Heartland National Estuary Partnership for those of you who may not be familiar with us. Uh, we are one of four national estuary program organizations in Florida and one of 28 in the United States. Perfect, Travis, thank you. Next slide. Um, so you'll see right here, this, that star indicates where we are. We cover uh, Southwest Florida from Donna Bay down to um, Estero Bay in Southwest Florida, from Sarasota down through South Lee, and then all the way up through the center of the state. Um, as a result of being congressionally designated estuaries of national significance in this part of Southwest Florida, we do receive special congressional funding and support through the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Water Act to protect and restore water resources in this area. Next slide. 
So you can see the uh, ch &E service area outlined here. We encompass over 5,000 square miles. The estuaries again, Lemon and Donna and Roberts Bay up in Sarasota. Uh, we have Pine Island Sound, Clusahatchee, San Carlos Bay, Estero Bay down in Lee County, and of course, Charlotte Harbor in the middle there in Charlotte County. Rivers are Mayaka Peace, Clusahatchee, and Estero. Um, just to name a few, we have 10 counties and 27 cities in the CHEP service area. Next slide, please. So really the CHNEP exemplifies the power of partnerships. We are a private public partnership that's science and consensus based, non-regulatory and citizen supported. And basically we're an umbrella organization. So you see some of the logos here, Lee County, Village of Estero are actual members of the CHNEP. So uh, of this broader partnership. And uh, we also work with FGC Water School, non-governmental organizations, so we have a whole broad spectrum of the public uh, sector at the local, state, and federal level and of the private sector. Um, because of our private contributions, volunteers, and donated in-kind services, we're able to get $19 worth of restoration for every federal dollar we receive. And I'm just going to go through some of the things we're doing in the Estero Bay watershed. Next slide, please. So to dive right in, all of our work is supported by a plan that was collectively drafted over two years by all of the partners. It's available on our website. So if you're interested in learning more about these issues that we're talking about today, there are whole sections on each one of these things, wastewater, septic to sewer, all of these things are outlined in the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan, which has four priority action areas, water quality improvement, hydrological restoration, fish, wildlife, and habitat protection, and public engagement. Next slide, please. The first project that I wanted to highlight that we help to support, we spend $90,000 a year to support water quality monitoring in the region as part of the Coastal Shoal Harbor Monitoring Network. Now you might think from that name that wouldn't include in Stero Bay, but it does, as you can see outlined in this map here. Uh, this is absolutely critical. Water quality monitoring drives us knowing where and how to use resources to improve water quality. So we have a deep longstanding commitment to funding water quality sampling, and we're happy to hear that the village of Estero and others are joining in to expand that water quality sampling effort. Next slide, please. So we take all of the water quality data that's available publicly from all sources, not just our own, but like the villages, other people who are sampling out there. And we try to put that together on one public website called the CHNEP Water Atlas. So you can Google this. Basically, it's, a, it's the hub for all water quality information. It also has all hydrology information that's being collected in the region. What this helps us do is to understand who's sampling what and where where the gaps are, what needs to be done to make sure that we have uniform, appropriate sampling throughout the region. Um, and it also has analytical tools that can track trends and, and key constituents like nutrients, nutrient pollution, or bacteria. So we can see, are things improving? Are they declining? And dive deeper when we see uh, things emerge from that data that need to be further researched and investigated. Next slide, please. Oh, I would go back and just say that the Water Atlas, we spend over $50,000 a year just to maintain that, and we're constantly enhancing and expanding it to have new features. The next slide is about a project we're doing right now, a pretty expensive project called the South Lee County Watershed Initiative, Initiative Hydrological Modeling Project. So this sounds pretty wonky. It's a $195,000 project that we're funding that basically looks at water quality data from surface and groundwater to determine how we can safely restore hydrology in the region because hydrology actually affects water quality. Water quantity and water quality are intertwined and the Lee County government has been doing great uh, work on looking at wet season conditions and stormwater and flood routing models to figure out what to do when we have these big storm events. But we also have an issue sometimes in the dry season with over drainage and not getting enough flow to natural systems like wetland areas to keep them healthy and functioning. 
So what we're doing is complementing the county's work in doing that dry season modeling and data gathering to look at natural systems so that we can understand how to protect the human environment and the natural environment simultaneously. Next slide, please. And I want to also mention that, um, if you could just go back one, uh, that we work on not only aquatic resources, but also terrestrial resources. So we recently completed what's called the Habitat Restoration Needs Plan, which took all existing terrestrial habitat maps out there and put them together to get one holistic view of what's needed to protect wildlife habitat in our region. We also included cutting edge climate science on habitat migration and response to sea level rise to look at what's gonna happen in the future with vegetative communities shifting in response to sea level rise. And so this map here, what this does is kind of identify in the blue areas, privately owned areas that are strategically important for preserving key habitats. And then the green areas are publicly owned lands uh, that are already protected, which some of which can be further restored or improved to improve their habitat value. So when you look at those together in that map, you see that there's landscape level habitat corridors and areas that are absolutely essential to protecting our wildlife now and into the future. Next slide, please. And just zooming in really quickly to the Estero Bay Basin, we have the results broken down by all the different basins in the CHEP area. You can see here on the left-hand side, all again, those privately owned lands that are important preservation conservation opportunities for wildlife. And then on the right-hand side, those publicly owned management enhancement uh, restoration areas uh, that need to be continually managed, enhanced, and restored to improve their value. And those really fit together, again, like pieces of a puzzle to create that landscape level protection that the wildlife needs. Next slide, please. And then finally, I want to say that one of the biggest things that we have to do is get policymakers and Congress and others to continually give us funding for these types of projects that we've been talking about today. So we have to make the case on what is the return on investment? What is the economic benefit of doing these environmental restoration projects? So recently, uh, we launched a two-year economic study uh, with a team of economists to look at what was the economic value um, they looked at copious amounts of data and pulled out only those that were directly tied to natural resource protection and management. And they determined that in the whole CHNEP area, we're seeing about $13.6 billion in total economic output annually, $3.8 billion in regional income, $146 million in local and state tax revenues, and overall that this is supporting 148,000 jobs annually in our region. Next slide. And again, this report is also broken into the basin. So you can see here in orange in the lower um, part of this map, that's the Estero Bay Basin. So we have um, the study zo zooming in, looking specifically at that basin, the primary economic drivers in the Estero Bay Basin are tourism, followed by agriculture and commercial fishing. Next slide, please. And then the results are that for the Estero Bay Basin, we're seeing 1.48 billion in annual economic benefits related to natural resource protection and management. 8.15 million in fishing production, 1.5 billion in recreational spending, 964 million in property value premiums, and 26 million in agricultural production. So a lot of great values that are being produced annually for our community as a result of these investments in natural resource protection and management. Next slide, please. And in closing, I just wanna say that uh, number one, the CHNEP is open to all members of our community. We really encourage the public to get involved. If you go on the chnep.org website, you can find all these reports that I just mentioned. You can subscribe for our free educational magazine. You can get volunteer notices and sign up as a volunteer. Uh, you can attend any of our meetings. They're all open to the public. We're gonna be hosting with the, CH, uh, the FGCU Water School uh, May 6th, a climate summit, the first Southwest Florida Climate Summit, which we're gonna be advertising here shortly um, on WGCU and opening up registration for. 
there's a lot of things that we do that you can get plugged into um, and we encourage you to learn more on our website, chnp.org. And then again, you can also go to the CHNP Water Atlas website, which is separate, to learn specifically more about your river, your waterway that you care about. Uh, the information on that is up there on that website. So thank you again very much for giving us this opportunity today. Thank you. Well, I, I, think, I think everybody here uh, Certainly appreciate you. You're giving back as well as almost all of our panelists are, are people to give back. Um, I, in fact, I'll say not almost all of them, all of them. Absolutely. Um, but with that, I'll thank very much all the panelists that, that took the time and the effort to put together your, your presentations and to spend the time with us today. We appreciate it. I will let each and every one of you know that if you need volunteers for any samplings or uh, even opinions or anything on the Estero River, we have a very active and concerned populace here at Pelican Sound and we will do anything that we can to help. Um, I, I think from, from the participant side of things, I think you all heard that uh, our river has been injured and uh, that's the bad news, but the good news is there are a multitude of people and agencies that are working to get it better again, and hopefully better than it was even beforehand. So with that, I will thank everybody that attended, and uh, you know we, we we're sorry that we had the technical issues up front, but um, you know it's 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 the new normal, unfortunately. But thank you very much. And uh, if anybody needs anything, you can always reach out to me. If you don't get to Janet with your questions, you can reach out to me. So thank you, and everyone have a good evening.